Uncommon is a production by Neural, a full-service digital agency. If you want to grow with a premium agency and have the ability to work with Jordan directly, then learn more at neural.com slash media and request a callback. That's N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E dot com slash media. My name's Jordan Michaelides and I'm the host of Uncommon, a show that asks the why on business, media, current affairs and sport. This Uncommon Corona Editions sees us catching up with prior guests that have been on the show to document how they're actually adapting to this once in a lifetime pandemic, I guess you could call it. Uh, If you like the episode, of course, please do subscribe on YouTube. Hit that like button. It helps us, of course, with the algorithm. Show notes for all guests, including previous ones, can be found at neural.com slash uncommon. Uh, For audio, if you want to listen on podcasts, just search Uncommon on all your good podcast apps. And for social, to keep up to date behind the scenes, search at Uncommon underscore show. With that all being said, thanks for tuning in and let's get into the episode. My guest this week is Nick Hodges, uh, strategic advisor to startups, investors and media companies, uh, founder of Blonde3 and board member of Startup Victoria. Uh, Nick, we were just chatting before. Uh, I know you've moved. How how did that go mid mid coronavirus? Uh, surprisingly, not challenging. Uh, yeah. It was sort of nice to have a change of scenery, uh, and then we we've, we've been in the new place three weeks, and we immediately uh, did a bunch of sort of remodelling. Uh, so. Uh, I, I may be I, I may be incriminating myself here, but. T- t- Today is the first uh, the first weekday that, that we haven't had uh, tradespeople uh, oh, yeah. in the house uh, doing stuff, uh, which is far as I know, it's, it's allowed. They're allowed to come in. Yeah, that's, that's um, essential. Every Nick, every job is essential. Every, every job is essential. Um, so it's been um, it's it's been an interesting experience for us. Um, which side of the Yarra were you living on prior? Oh, south, always south. Always south, okay. So you've always been on the right side of the arrow. Oh, no, no, when I was at university and you meant to live on the north. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I said this to Lauren the other day. But I feel like I said it to you when we caught up for coffee a, a month or so ago. Maybe it was two months ago. Um, I, My last coffee, last, last work coffee with a, with a person. Really? Yep. So it must have been Feb. I think it was Feb. I haven't looked back at my calendar. Um. I'm I'm over living this close to the city slash the era. I need to get back over to the um the southeastern suburbs, um, get back to my roots. We've actually been looking at like where would we move to, um, because my parents are still in Brighton, but Lauren's parents have moved to um, do you know Martha Cove? No, sounds flash though. It it's it's sort of like a glorified uh, old people's home like a retirement village but it's like a development down at um safety beach so, uh, yeah we, we're sort of considering uh as we get married over the next year and consider things like kids where do we start living being closer to parents would be nice but so not anyway, too close not too close not too close at all um now speaking of kids um you you gave me some amazing notes for uh questions to ask people over this coronavirus series um and one of the first ones that stood out to me i I wish i could remember them all now (laughs) (laughs) well one of the ones was around scarification i feel like that's got some of the best um moments we had dan monheit who doesn't see it like world war ii and then we've got the week after shura taft who sees it like world war ii so i guess for you from your perspective what's um how do you see this moment? Uh, I was about to say good question, but apparently I, I, I fed you the question, so <laughs> I won't say that. Um, look, it, it, it's something that I've really since the start of, uh, or, or since it became clear that this was going to become global, it's been an interesting thing to think about. I think probably a starting point for thinking about the idea of scarification and the idea of, of long-term impact on or long-term sort of generational impact um, is probably that it's 
it's hard to see a revolution when you're living in it. And I think probably when we're thinking about the long-term sort of social impacts of of this, you know, reasonably sort of six to 12 months, it, it's probably hard to understand the scale of it um, until we're out of it. So I think this is as sitting on the fence as you can get, but it could be that it creates um, uh, long-term behavioural changes uh, within within society and within people mm. um, based on their life stage right now that, that, that will flow through, sort of like, you know, grandparents of, um, you know, my generation's grandparents, you know, they, were, they always talked about rationing and, you know, they always, you know, yeah. used the last little bit of jam and stuff. And so, you know, that's, prob- that's a really extreme thing. But I, I think I'm very cautious of, A, using war terminology and, B, putting this experience in parallel to, to, to going through, you know, half a decade of war and, and, and the, the longer-term impacts of that. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's that. Um, but my other thought is maybe it's not. Maybe it's a blip. And, and that perhaps, you know, children that are being born today are going to um, be, you know, constantly sort of getting up us about, you know, talking about the time that we all had to go into isolation. It's like, it really, really it doesn't sound that bad, does it? Mm. Um, so, yeah, look, I think it'll be interesting. Um, you know, I think at the start, I had a few conversations with people who were like, yeah, you know, a lot of my friends obviously love to pile on boomers. Um, and, you know, it was, there was a lot of discussion around, you know, sort of the, I, I guess the response to this crisis from um, some older generations who, who naturally sort of um, uh, sort of sway more conservatively was, oh, this isn't a problem. You know, you kids today, you haven't lived through hardships. And, you know, a lot of my friends were like, well, like neither of you, like like the, the, the boomer generation is the least scarified generation in the history of, 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 of civilization, really. Like they, they lived through a post-war boom. Um, the, the, like the Vietnam War is probably, you know, Korea War, Vietnam War is is sort of the biggest thing that they could hold up as sort of causing, um, you know, any long-term behavioural change, but arguably it didn't really at all. Um, and, and so, you know, they haven't really lived through much. And so to, to, to sort of turn around and be like, well, you know, you kids today, you wouldn't know how hard it is. Like, actually, it's probably the most significant thing that's happened in their lives too that, in, that- in terms of this. Sort that, of situation. That situation. meme for them changed a bit, though. I, I did notice that in um, our parents' generation, but it, it went quickly from uh, this is nothing to like, particularly like maybe late March, early April. Yeah. Early April is when people really started to go, oh, okay, fuck, this is, this is serious. Yeah. Let's call it the Tom Hanks moment, shall we? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, look, well, my thing about that is, is I'm sort of being cautious. I think it could be maybe not damaging, but, but I think everyone could get very sort of self, self-absorbed. And we're seeing this already in sort of corporate hot takes about, oh, how is this going to change the future of work and things like that. I, I, I think, hate yeah, that shit. Yeah, we could, we could get really self-absorbed really quickly about how this has changed us. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's basically going to be, you know, television is going to be unwatchable sort of in 12 months because of all the, you know, documentaries and uh, current affairs and 60 minutes about, oh, how has this changed us? Um, when it's a thing to go through, um, is it sort of a scarifying moment? You know, Who knows? probably not. Well, it's, it's interesting you mentioned um, about the potential long-term implications. I remember when, before I interviewed Dan, he was on a podcast. Um, it's Russell Howcroft's and... Uh, God, Alex, what's his name? I can't remember the, the bloke's name. I'm meant to be interviewing him soon. That's so bad. Uh, <laughs> um, but they, they made, they created a book called uh, Right Brain. Uh, and then they have, so they've got the, the Right Brain Movement and then there's the Right Brain Workout, which is their new podcast. And so they were talking about how workplaces, like in a sense, commercial office spaces will change and they're trying to debate what will the thing be the things that slingshot back. And I was thinking, you know, what will be the things that slingshot back for us versus stay the same? Like as an example, about a month ago, when it came to leads in the agency, 
uh, there was nothing. But now people have realized, okay, well, we have to do something. We have to market to our audience. But they are there. The mood of the consumer or the client has completely changed. They are no longer. We we'd never really been the type to offer retainers or locking contracts unless for specific services or if the client asks for it. And now that has actually become quite a competitive advantage for us. Like we found that we've been in deals amongst three different agencies, and they've just gone with us, even though the pricing is relatively the same because we're not locking them in for that six month period and they've got flexibility. And I can sort of see how that would be a thing that will, that will not change in the industry because the consumer wants it. Um, there's also the fact that so many of the sales meetings now are done via zoom. And I wonder how many meetings in person will, you know, like how many people are going to be like, well, oh, don't worry about coming up to Sydney, just present over zoom. Do yeah. You know what I mean? So, so I, I think there's, like, there's two things there. One being that point around, like, it's never been more okay to be unsure in your job. It's never been more okay to say, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, and a lot of my work now revolves around that, revolves around scenario planning and helping to think about a future that is more unknown than it's ever been. So what... What we are seeing and what I'm seeing as well is, um, is, is, yeah, customers of my clients who are like, we don't know what's going to happen in six months, but we need this thing now. So, yeah, you know, yeah, great. Yeah. If, if, like, if, if, it's, if, it's a, if it's a project-based contract or it's just a piecemeal thing, customers are, are fine with that. Now, I think there's a good counter-argument, which is that people will desire confidence a lot coming out of this. And when we say coming out of this, it's important to sort of note that this is going to take a while. You know, this, it's not, you know, it's, it's, again, it's not a war. There's not a day that it's over. It's, it's this slow and sort of drawn out process. But, you know, as, as people start going back into their offices, which I think they will, um, as people, you know, start sort of returning to the normality of work, which I think um, people like maybe craving or, you know, people, mm. I, I think to a degree, want to get back into the rut of work. And I think that maybe that assurance, that idea that the, the future is, is known could um, actually be quite desirable. So to counter the idea that the short-term sort of getting in and doing project-based work is going to be a long-term trend, I think there's a counter-argument that may be just as strong, which is people are going to want to feel sure and confident about the decisions they're making and want to feel like they're living in a world that's not about to suddenly turn upside down. Yet. Yeah, I, um, I, I would agree with that. So it's sort of like um, the, the mood of the moment or horses for courses right now is short-termism is what helps you survive. Mm-hmm. Whereas in uh, uh, 12 to 18 months from now, going back to thinking long-term is what will help survive for a business just by the night, but by the matter of where things are. Yeah. Or it's, you know, it's just the natural, it's, it's just the desire that people have. They're going to want that, whether it's a smart thing to do, whether it's strategically correct is, is a different story, mm-hmm. but I think it's what they're going to desire. is going to be that. Um, there was, there was something there around, um, the economy and I know you sent me a really good um, document from uh, McKinsey, which is sort of, I I really like um, what's his name? Uh, Martin North, who we've interviewed for a client's podcast. Um, uh, He's sort of, he runs a business called digital finance analytics and they do a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to consulting for financial businesses. Um, I'm pretty sure he actually used to be, one of the founding MDs at McKinsey when they came out here um, back in the seventies or eighties, he's originally from the UK, really, really smart guy. Um, And so I've, I've had a read through your document and I was watching his live stream last night, which is um, always interesting to watch. Um, The economy is what is on everyone's lips right now. Now that they feel some sense of um, comfort that the numbers have come down um, and I can sort of see people starting to relax. And that's another topic in and of itself around uh, case numbers. But the topic at the moment is what does the economy look like for the next six, 12 and 18 months? I mean, it's obvious 
uh, unemployment is massive. I think uh, on Martin's uh, piece last night, the job numbers and revenues are down like 30 and 20% in both arts and hospitality. So that, those are the two industries which have been devastated by this. And we're starting to see this trend in uh, mortgage pressure in houses um, and, and real wages starting to come down, but savings starting to increase. So he was saying in this, this live stream that it's very hard right now to predict where things are going, but you can uh, imagine if things are cut off in September, uh, we're going to have a massive deflationary moment in the economy. So I guess from your perspective, what are you thinking about in the next six, 12 and 18 months for, for what's potentially going to happen? Um, like I say, you know, no, no one can be sure. Um, and I think that the temptation is for people to have hot takes um, because, you know, that'll make for good, you know, content and LinkedIn posts uh, and things like that. So, Look, I, I can't say what I'm thinking for the next six to twelve to eighteen months is going to happen. Um, I know, I know what I'm observing in real time. I've made some bets of that that you know have, have turned out right so far. So, my my general thesis um, for, for the probably for the past sort of four weeks since my sort of tracking of the of the health data started to sort of show uh, or started to point at the situation that we're in now. Which is that I think we, uh, I think is what I'm referring to as sort of a, an opportunity for optimism arbitrage, mm. which is, um, we, we, which is that people, and this is probably, um, you know, largely, well, not largely, a, a massive contributing factor to this is the media. But um, people in Australia have a, a, a very pessimistic view about what's going to happen to the economy. Um, they, have, they have a very pessimistic view about, the future, and yet, if you ask them, and this was in that McKinsey report, yet th that they then self-report that they don't have as pessimistic view um, of, about their personal um, sort of situation. So, the, the the single biggest concern in the McKinsey study that people had about um, co the, the impact of COVID nineteen was Australia's economy. Mm -hmm. That that is the single highest thing that gets rated um, as a concern. Yeah, and then way down the list, around sort of so that's up around sixty percent. Way down the list, around thirty percent, you have people being concerned about their job, and being concerned about. I think they phrase it as being able to make ends meet. Mm. So there is a huge gap between the level of concern about the Australian economy and the level of concern about people's personal situations. Now. I don't want to make the fatal mistake that so many people make, which is equating or, or trying to treat an economy like a household budget because it's not. But that gap is so large that there is this sort of what I'm calling this 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 optimism arbitrage opportunity, um, which is the future is probably um, we can be more optimistic about the future than then we're acting. Um, there is more downside priced into markets. There is more pessimism built into modeling um, and, that, and that things will probably be more op optimistic in the long term um, or things will turn out more optimistically um, in the long term than what's currently, you know, the easiest way to look at it is what's currently being priced into the market. But that flows through to what the impact on, on sort of so many things is going to be. And now the, the caveat to that is, any any recovery when we're talking about sort of positive um, sort of impact versus what we're expecting is that any um, any positive sort of change is, is going to be so secular. It's it's you know no matter what people in the tourism industry, people in the airlines, um, are, are in for a really really bad time. Yeah, um, yeah, it's going to be industry specific. Yeah, but people who work in banks aren't. And so you have entire industries, you have entire, you know, swathes of the population um, distributed um, not quite randomly, which I think is a, you know, there's a danger of, of, of real inequality in this recovery as well. But what you have is you, you have, you know, lots of people who um, 
are not going to feel a major economic impact um, from this 12 months. They'll feel it, it, it will be a, um, you know, mild recession sort of impact. Um, and then you'll have other people that will feel a huge impact. But those people who feel a, a minor impact are also going to be living um, with with record low interest rates. Um, with you know the RBA yesterday, I think was 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 talking about you know sub two percent inflation, and it, it, it will probably be quite low um, sort of inflationary environment. And so, you know, reasonably, those people um, will will be spending. Um, they will have also gone through. Um, and I haven't, I haven't actually looked at um, household savings um, or if there's been a household savings report in the past couple of months. But, you know, I would take a stab that if you, um, if you look at people who still are doing their jobs, if you look at white collar workers that are working at home, if you look at um, people who, who sort of haven't had a big hit on their income, I, I, I hazard a guess that um, savings rates are, are through the roof simply because we can't do stuff. Yeah, um, I'd agree so, with that. So, you know, it, I, I think the recovery is, is going to be, or not even the recovery already, I think there's, there's a sort of arbitrage between what people are um, sort of expecting to happen and what, what is going to happen. Um, and at the same time, I think the watch out there is that it's, it's, it's going to be secular. It's going to throw up massive opportunities for inequality that, that we probably should watch out for as well. Yeah, and I, I'd, I'd agree. I just, I'm thinking about my own circumstances. I remember when this this started really kicking off in Australia, probably March, April is when Lauren and I tightened our budgets. Um, so we're already saving high amounts, but now we're probably saving ridiculous amounts. I mean, m- most of our entertainment and uh, I guess going out money is not really spent at all. Um, instead, that money has been spent on improving things within our lives. I, I know that there are people we know that work at say organizations like Target um, in the marketing team and they've seen like record sales um, obviously because people are shopping online. Right. So mm. I think that goes to your point that um, it will definitely be felt in areas where we're just not able to go spend that money ordinarily. And um, I was looking at obviously going back to Martin's uh, live stream last night, I, I'd already believed coming from sort of that Buffett and Howard Marks school of investing of opportunism I'd already taken some investments probably about a month or so ago when the market really dipped down, but um, it was reinforced when I saw that primary industries really haven't changed, like mining and agriculture um, and some parts of manufacturing aren't really that down that much at all, which tells me that people are still buying things that they need to make stuff, um, whether that be construction or whatever it may be. Yeah, well, and actually there were construction numbers out yesterday that showed that construction was, was, was down significantly, which I, th- I thought was interesting and maybe surprised me a bit. But one of my clients is, is your grocer, who's a grocery delivery startup. And, you know, the fact is everyone's eating the same amount of food. Mm. It's just that the way that they're accessing that food um, is different. Um, and so, you know, your grocer works with sort of independent grocers, um, works with you know dairy companies things like that. So you take you know some of these independent dairies um, like Schultz or, or St David or Baramba, and they have vans and trucks that they're not using anymore. So there is a decrease in jobs because they're, they're not going around and dropping off milk to as many um, cafes and restaurants and stuff. They're still doing a lot of cafes, but all the restaurants and stuff are out. Yeah. But people are still drinking the same amount of milk. Yeah. Um, it's just they're doing it in different ways. Different channels. Yeah. yeah. So there's actually a sidebar here on a, a, an interesting theory, which I think is partially true, but not doesn't 100% explain the toilet paper, the run on toilet paper, um, which was a stat that, that um, out of the US, um, that something like 60% of all toilet paper um, is used not in the home. Um, so it's basically people in workplaces or public places. Um, 60% of toilet paper is like consumed outside of the home. So <laughs> suddenly, if it, suddenly if everyone's trapped in their home, of course there's going to be a run on toilet paper. Yeah. Um, but, but there's so, also, there's also saying to the toilet paper thing as well, like because the way that toilet paper is consumed normally and the way that it's packaged normally, it, you can't actually get that many, packs of toilet paper on shelves. That's why they take up an entire fucking aisle 
So when there was the original run, you know, people are buying 24 packs, but you don't need 24 rolls of toilet paper. It would be better if it was evenly distributed amongst people to have six each. And you can actually see that now when you go to Coles and they've still got their um, restrictions, you know, one toilet paper, two milk, et cetera. Um, you're having to buy toilet paper more regularly than you would have in the past because they only have Quilton six pack or three pack uh, toilet rolls, which is is why I think there was that psychological element to that run on toilet paper is just the way that it's packaged. It scares the shit out of people when all of a sudden someone's like, oh, I've got to stock up on toilet paper and now there's none. And so it just yeah. becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But I want to just... Well, I, think, I think I've mentioned this before to you. This whole crisis is going to, it's going to be fodder for sort of economics white papers for, for decades <laughs> to come. Psychology. Because I, I, that was the biggest yeah. thing for me is, is understanding the run on toilet paper. I had to understand that and I feel like I've gotten to it in the last month. Because I look, for, I look I, forward to the paper about uh, you know the, the invisible hand and toilet the, the invisible hand grabbing for the toilet paper you know <laughs> because I I was in Japan in October 2019 during their typhoon and I could understand the run the different runs on food because I'd seen it firsthand over a 48 hour period and so we prepared by buying some more tin food because we don't have any tin food in the house but I could not wrap we never thought oh, okay toilet paper we better stock up on that. So anyway, but it, this McKinsey um, report, we'll have to link it in uh, the show notes. It's really interesting to see things like, I don't know if the audience can even see that because of the glare. You can't see shit. But ba- basically down in the corner is us with Japan, which is getting a bit sketchier, just speaking to some uh, friends in Japan at the moment, Singapore and South Korea. So you can sort of see the, the, the decisions that were made have helped us immensely, but also um, as a proportion of GDP, the support in the economy. I think we're only, we're third to the UK and Germany, which is quite amazing for a conservative government. Mm. It makes you start to question a lot of things around um, well, welfare in this country. Um, but it's, it's just a very interesting report to read that I, I think people, particularly in my parents' generation, would get a lot out of. Um, just understanding where things are. Um, have you been speaking to anyone in Adland at all at the moment? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been talking to a few people in media, a few people in creative. Look, I mean, even even the people in those industries were well aware that they were, you know, they have been coasting along for about five years, sort of right for, I don't want to, you know, use the D word, but right for massive disruption. Like, like that industry just needed to be completely turned upside down, you know, all the way from, you know, ad tech to creative production was, was you know, just a house of cards in, in many ways. Um, and mm-hmm. so this is, um, this is starting to precipitate a lot of that change, I think. Um, the... You know the, the the impact on media in particular. You know how does that flow on to ad tech? Is going to be sort of interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, the 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 structural elements of sort of the agency model and and how marketing works um, and how that that interrelates with media. It, that structural piece is is made up of lots of pieces, and it's like this big jumbled scaffold that is not just big and jumbled, but it's also so old that it's quite rusted. Um, mm-hmm. So. It's not being dismantled quickly, um, but it is one of the long-term things that I think it's it's not like we're in for, you know, a sharp three-month or six-month change um, in in the models of advertising and media and agencies. Um, it's probably more like a two-year um, sort of restructuring of what that looks like. Um, what what, and, do you, what do you think is the biggest thing that has, has to change about agencies um like particularly around uh marketing and creative agencies i'm just for my own just inefficiencies just just inefficiencies um and and, and probably a little bit of the hubris like like the some of the narratives that that were coming out of agencies would you know the idea that 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 what advertising and marketing and agencies was doing was so central to businesses 
um, and, and, you know, so fundamentally important to what they were doing that, you know, they should be, you know, absolutely central to, you know, all C-suite decisions um, was, was, was just, you know, nonsense. Yeah. Um, you know, even a CMO, like, you know, I, I often used to, um, when I was in agencies, we'd often talk about this idea that, you know, it, it, that there, there have been studies of CMOs and how they spend their time and their energy and, you know, that they basically spent 10% of their time and energy thinking and caring about the media planning and media investment. And yet they have a whole agency with a whole, you know, depending on the size, they, with, with, with teams of people thinking about something that the CMO only spends one day a fortnight thinking about. Mm. Um, and, and so within that was this assumption that, that advertising and marketing was so much more important than it really is. And I'm not saying it's not important, but... I think the narrative sort of got carried away. And the number two is just the inefficiency, which I don't think is a surprise to anybody. Um, it was, it was it, it's in most people's interest to, to build complexity into the, the models. Mm. Um, most of what the agency world does is highly commoditized. Um, that which isn't highly commoditized is, hard, is, is extremely hard to measure. Um, so... Look, efficiencies just need to be created. I've talked to a few people who've gone into new agency positions over the, actually during this during this uh, crisis, um, and you know it's encouraging to talk to them and hear them talking about some of their plans, which um, which is to basically take advantage of of that fact, and that there's going to be um, the next sort of twelve to twenty four months is going to see um, sort of. CMOs on one end and media companies on the other end completely rethinking the structures that are built um, between them. And when you say structures, does that mean the way that things are priced, the way that things are offered? Because it's got me thinking around um, the fact that a lot of agencies will go in and they'll either price to fit or the fact that operationally they have x amount of staff and so therefore they have to charge y amount no matter who the client is is that yeah. what you're thinking about yeah look the products they're selling the way they're selling them the way they're pricing them the way they're delivering them the value that they bring the way they're measuring them um the way that agencies are built the way that they're structured the way the holding companies operate um yeah i think everything's up for change mm. um and you know, so much of it is there's so many layers of complexity that have been built in because no one really wants to sort of look under the hood um, that, you know, it's it's going to be a, a sort of a complicated unwinding. But at the same time, you've got, you know, you look at marketers and, and there's a lot of CMOs that used to be sort of somewhere in that structure um, and they know they know how to sort of start to untangle it. So we'll start to yeah. see some good CMOs make some big changes. And look, I'm not saying it's the end of the holding companies. I think you take, you know, some of the people leading the holding companies, um, you know, really understand this. You look at, you know, probably I'm closest to WPP. So, you, you know, I have full confidence that Mark Reed, who's now running WPP, knows that this is what's going to happen. And some of the moves he's been doing, I think, uh, um, show that, that they understand that there's going to be this this sort of, um, you know, changing of the structure and, and vast simplification. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot there I, I, it's funny you mentioned the point about hubris because um there was like an agency that launched maybe a few months ago that had been from one of the big four agencies so it's obviously a an md or someone who'd gone and and started on their own and uh they talk about new ways of working and doing things and being driven by data and the comment section on umbrella is just my favorite like it's just, it's the funniest thing to read. Some of them was like, oh, great. Okay. So an agency that's using this, this, and this sounds like you're really changing the business model. <laughs> and and yeah. I, think, I feel and like that's what you're tapping into. Well, that's the scary thing, isn't it? Like the people that think that they're doing things differently are not mm. like, like, yeah, the people that are going, going oh, we're going to be informed by data. And, and, you know, it's like, you know, it's like the classic thing about standards. You, you look for a standard, you, you see that there's six of them and they've all got a problem. So you realise that, well, what if we built this one that solves all the problems and now you've got seven standards? Um, you know, it's, it's, you take what's wrong with an agency, you try and solve it and now you've just got another problem um, because you, but by default, because of the structure, because of everything that exists and your inability to overcome it with one sort of, you know, big change, um, you have to adapt to it. And so what you'll end up with is, 
you know, you can go out with the best intentions to build, you know, this, this beautiful agency, this beautiful approach to marketing and media and creative and whatever. Um, but, but you have to operate in an environment whereby you're going to naturally end up adding complexity, working out how to, you know, flip the ticket on the way through and you end up acting like everyone who you're trying to overthrow. Mm. Well, what would you say to a young agency owner like myself as to, because there are a few that listen to this podcast, what, how can they start to build on some of these inefficiencies and offer a better operating model? Um, I, 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 it, it has to come, it has to come from clients. So look, there's a temptation to say, well, just, you know, work out radical approaches and go and, you know, completely change the way you're operating and, 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 and go out and put that in market and stuff. But, um, I actually think finding, you know, finding three clients who want to completely rethink the way that the model works, um, is, is the best way to do it. Start there. I, I, I had to, uh, I had to be a proponent of uh, trickle down economics, but this is, <laughs> this is probably a case where, you know, it's only going to come, it's only going to come from the top because, um, the clients are the ones that are, that are paying the bills. That's interesting. Okay. I want to jump to, um, other elements of the economy. Um, there's a lot on China here. I remember when we were first discussing, um, you know, the potential implications globally in the geopolitical realm. Um, that was quite interesting, but I think the biggest and most obvious one or point to cover is supply chains. Um, I think it's sort of obvious, at least politically and culturally at the moment, how, how many people are realizing the West was underprepared when it came to its own uh, supply chains by offshoring a lot of that stuff. We've therefore made ourselves very weak at responding to shocks like this. Um, and the biggest discussion I, or the biggest change I've seen is, is the mentality from either side of politics that something has to change in terms of the way that supply chains are managed and particularly the relationship with countries like China. It's not specifically China, but um, I think the, the thing that I've heard from either politics is countries that uh, are more authoritarian, I guess, and exporting your uh, supply chain to areas like that. So, you know, as an example, someone spoke about Vietnam recently, but there have been questions raised about, well, is that just more of the same if it's moved to Vietnam? Um, are we just funneling money to uh, essentially slave labor so a certain class of people can do well in that home country um, to then potentially have another shock down 10 years from now um, that, is, that is basically the same thing. So I, I guess I think you mentioned a term, distributed globalism. So you're sort of looking at uh, more elements created locally but not wholly locally. Um, what are your thoughts around supply chains at the moment? I mean, I have preface that I'm not a supply chain expert. Um, I can talk to you. I can, I can talk a fair bit about too about getting uh, food from Victoria onto uh, into the houses of people in Melbourne. But um, <laughs> look, there's, there's a few parts to this. One is, um, and I realise that that apparently, you know, we're we're not allowed to talk about things being an overreaction. But I think it might be an overreaction <laughs> to say that. Um, or to plan for a future shock where, where all the countries close their borders again. Like that's such a, it's such a rare thing. You know, I've, I've, I've got a client um, in London who, who's ex-military um, and he's lived a life of scenario planning. And, you know, you talk to, talk to him and you talk to people who do this stuff for a living and they're like, you know what, this was never in the scenario plan. Like every country just locking down their borders and everyone staying at home, no one, no one thought about that. Mm. So, you know, if it could be a, a massive waste of money to start building in the future, um, whether it's supply chain or whether it's whatever, um, uh, sort of plans that, that, allow, that, that, that presume that this will happen again. Um, but, yeah, the other piece there is is the... Did the, the the sort of you know great 
globalism sort of neoliberal experiment fail in that respect. Um, and you know what, maybe it did, but everyone really loved the cheap prices. Um, the distributed globalism sort of idea, I think, is is already taking shape. Um, I think, you know, you mentioned Vietnam, you know, basically so much of China's, you know, when people think about China being the world's factory, it's just fundamentally not true anymore. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it, it moved to Vietnam years ago. It moved to the Philippines years ago. Africa. Um, it, it's, it's, it's starting to move to Africa, which is a whole other sidebar, which... Is, is fascinating, not just from a supply chain perspective, but from a resources perspective and could be a sad but positive thing for the Australian economy. I'll, I'll park that one over there. Um, but, yeah, the, the, there already is this distributed globalism, but it still has issues on, um, I guess, that sort of ethical layer. Um, it still has issues on, on sort of... Um, on, on, on shutting down of supply chains, um, you know, for if, if, you, if you look at what's happening now, you're still going to have the same problems. So I think it's a, it's a tough one. I think, I think, you know, one of the things, one of the dangers is now people are going to try and start optimising their businesses or, or creating resilience in their businesses to deal with the shock that's just happened. And the shock that's just happened might be such an outlier that, that it's, it means that their businesses are not resilient to more likely future shocks. Mm. I, I do wonder, though, if, if the trend becomes not so much the shifting of supply chains, but um, it gets branded as like vertical integration and making that closer to your original base because maybe there's savings on logistics as opposed to, you know, the costs that, that may be saved from manufacturing outside of Australia. Yeah. And, 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 you know, look, there's, there's sort of obviously technological, technological advances in a lot of manufacturing um, that would sort of lead to that. Having said that, you know, Australia hasn't, you know, actually built a car um, on, on a major production line for a while now. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I think there's, there's a couple. Uh, there's a couple of things that I think could be could be positive out of this. One is, well, there's, there's one that's quite dangerous, which is sort of this nationalism um, uh, around sort of the production of things and the idea. You know, it's it's very strong in the US, and it always has been quite strong in the US um, that you know things should be made in America. So there is a danger in that because it feeds into the tribalism that that's um, that is sort of the backlash to to globalization and, and sort of neoliberalism, but one thing that I find super interesting, and there's been a bit of writing about this and a bit of thinking about this, is that um, more diverse societies and more interesting societies, so, so the more variation we have in the things that we do within our cities and within our country, the more diversity of, of thought and the more diversity of culture and the more diversity of people we get. Um, so. You know, if Australia is just a mining country and four banks, you know, it, it, it's really bad for culture. It's really bad for cities. Um, and, you know, you can see the extreme version of this in, um, you know, cities in China where, you know, everyone comes in, lives in the dormitory, you know, that they make, you know, very, the cities that just make light bulbs, basically. And, you know, that's not good for culture. So I think an interesting sort of side effect that I really like the idea of is, is that actually by, by increasing diversification of what we're doing locally has, has some really nice sort of flow on effects um, of what's possible. Right. Um, so it, it's, sort of, it's sort of like the, the meme that has happened in agriculture in the last 10 years of going from feedlot farming to um, uh, it's, it's not animal husbandry, but it's sort of like distributed farming so let's say you've got a 10 acre farm you have cows that roam an acre or two and then coming through next will be trailers yeah. of chickens that will scratch through the grass yeah. and then the next thing that will come through are pigs and the next thing that come through will be goats and so it'll be this and i have a friend who has a farm like that and the benefit is that your key uh commodity becomes something entirely different which is feed or grass in this case and so yeah. what, what actually happens in his farm is you capture more carbon and therefore you grow more grass, which means you save money on feed and you have a healthier, happier animal that goes at a higher price. 
Yeah. So, and not only that, you also, be, you know, that, that sort of biodynamic approach is, builds in resilience. Yeah. Which can, ha- which can take outside of a farm situation. You can turn into a manufacturing and a services situation um, you know, at a city scale or at a state scale or at a country scale. And it, it leads to, it leads to um, sort of diversification and that leads to resilience. Yeah. Um, and and, and if, from an Australian point of view, I think that's, you know, one of the things that, that, that makes our economy relatively strong. Um, we have sort of mining as a big, thing but outside of that you know the, the the relative relatively good diversification is is a strength um in the economy mm. as well and like you know education right now is taking a massive hit tourism is taking a massive hit but there are other things um that, that that are not taking a massive hit and so we're not um as exposed as we could be yeah and, and these sort of things as well allow for a lot of arbitrage like the thing that's come from that agricultural development is that land that is highly eroded is basically worthless to most farmers who operate in the old way. But someone like my friend can come in and buy that land um, 50 cents, 40 cents on the dollar and improve that land over a three year period by this new approach and therefore increase the value of the land. So it's um, yeah, I think you're, I think you're definitely right. And and one of these things uh, around supply chains and let's call it diversification is one of the topics we spoke about over email is the tech world and the tech capital. Um, I think you were saying that um, this is going to be very interesting for Silicon Valley. How do you feel about that now since we last spoke about it around a month ago? Uh, probably, probably more. Probably more sure that, uh, that <laughs> it's um, it, 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 look, look, I mean, the Silicon Valley and there's sort of the tech world and the two are sort of very, very tightly intertwined. Um, I think, you know, the tech companies spent decades, you know, telling the world that they could solve any problem um, and that software was eating the world uh, and, you know, that they were going to, you know, bring the internet to India um, or bring, you know, internet balloons to the world. And then, you know, basically saying we can solve all the world's problem, all the world's problems from, you know, Mountain View and Menlo Park. And then the world had a really big problem and they have not been able to do a thing. They, you know, it's it's been remarkable how, how completely weak any response has been. Um, you know, and there's the exception maybe being Google and Apple, which um, has been positive, but still, you know, I think they're releasing it sort of mid-May. Could they have done something faster? Definitely. Um, you know, I had, a, I had a long conversation with a technologist about how, you know, we would spec out a contact tracing app that utilised what's already in smartphones. Um, importantly, you know, something that I'm yet to see from Google or Apple is, importantly, um, uh, smartphones that are three or four generations old. Um, mm. Because currently everything I've seen is basically creating contract tracing for the rich, um, but it's not going to be very good for people in Brazil. It's not going to be very good for people in India. Um, mm. So, yeah, I think I think they've, yeah, like I said, after after telling the world that you know technology is the solution to every problem, a big problem came along, and you know they haven't been able to do a thing. <laughs> so, what's the solution to every problem? <laughs> who's the ne- who's the next um, elite that come out comes out and says that? Um, in what sense? I don't know. I, I feel like um, I feel like what you're uh, vocalizing is and has excel- accelerated what people already thought about tech companies. That actually they're just big corporations now. They're yeah, and, and I mean, this is the thing. What what is what has this last three months done? It's just been a short circuit for what was going to happen over the next sort of three to five years, anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know everyone, everyone who sort of spent enough time thinking about the tech world was well aware that the current Silicon Valley model, the current breed within there, if you think about you know Carlota Perez's um, sort of phases, that. Um, 
you know, it's that, that we're deep into the maturity phase of that part of Silicon Valley, that we have definitely gone through the frenzy. We've definitely gone through the synergy phase. All the money was made in frenzy and synergy. And, and you know, the, the, the venture capitalists, I think, probably know this deep down. Um, and it's why they will, you know, they'll now let in, um, you know, PE firms into series A's because they know that now, you know, that it's, it's, it's not the same game. The, mm. the, the sort of the ballpark they're playing in is, is that maturity phase and what they're looking for and, you know, what VCs in particular have been, you know, furiously looking for for the past three or four years is what is, what's the next eruption phase? What's the new thing? And, you know, the, there hasn't been anything near enough to being big enough um, that, that, that it's been meaningful. You know, for a while it was blockchain and then it was sort of AI and ML. Um, you know, for about six weeks it was CRISPR. You know, they're, they're furiously looking for this next eruption phase. But the fact is that tech in general, as, as, as we sort of look at it now, is in that maturity phase and, and these companies are just big companies now. Silicon Valley is, is you know, essentially just the new Wall Street. So if it's the people who have power, um, people who have money, Power and money generally makes you a douchebag. So, increasingly seeing douchebags. <laughs> I, I still think, though, that um, this meme of distribution and particularly things like blockchain have a part to play. Um, I think hitting... they will. I think they will, but I think they're not fundamental to that eruption phase. Right. Okay. What, what do you think is most likely to be fundamental to that, or you can't see anything yet? You can't. I mean, yeah, you just can't see. You can't see until you're in it. And, you know, if you consider that really the last, um, you know, the, the, the last sort of cycle in that sort of Carlotta Perez model was, was probably smartphones. Um, and, you know, everyone has, well, not everyone, but there are multiple theories about, you know, what, what is, what do we actually call that phase? But I think the internet was one where we went through the eruption, frenzy, synergy um, and, and maturity phase. I think smartphones was another um, and now we've gone through that and all the things that come with smartphones and, you know, whether it's just the fact that we're creating GPS and camera chips at such a scale that it allows other things. But um, when the smartphone came along, we didn't know that that was going to have the impact that it did. Um, mm. So, you know, if, if there is a contender, ironically, it's probably, um, I don't want to say 5G, but it's probably this idea that just everything is on the network. Um, yeah, that that is interesting to me, and um, <laughs> it's funny to see the just you know it's really funny is this whole thing about people who are paranoid that five uh, G spreads coronavirus, but they're willing to use four G. It's got to be one of the greatest ironies out there. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think you're right. I think um, it, it's been interesting using the NBN and that sort of whole crossover period. And I noticed that when we were going through, through that, the ADSL that we had connected to our location was so useless that we just went straight to wireless and the 4G was good enough. The only problem is they throttled it. So uh, I can see with a 5G environment how it's just cheaper to move to having some sort of, uh, you know, wireless connection as opposed to getting cable and paying for all that fiber cable. I mean, that, that is one of the big things in India, right, is they, they skipped cable altogether and went straight to wireless and they have yeah. pretty good internet um, for a country that's got 1.4 billion people. Um, I, I want to touch on China. I know you were, you were thinking about a month ago that I, I, it seemed likely – about a month ago, the way that things are rolling out, that the US was at, in a really critical area and that, that they did not look good globally. They're pulling money from the WHO. Um, Trump was in denial about what was going on, essentially. Uh, people were or seemed to be in denial in the US that um, it really existed and, you know, we're seeing cases now where they actually think it was in the US from as far back as December. I think there was a case of pneumonia revised in California from December. Um, but that was one of the other big things that I've noticed is, is the change in mentality from, from either side of politics around China, particularly here. Here was the biggest shock for me when Penny Wong came out and spoke about 
we need to have this um, this investigation into what happened. That was when I started to to really take notice and say, like, okay, China politically outside of their domestic market is in big trouble, like big, big long-term trouble. And so everyone's talk, spoken about Thucydides' trap, which is, you know, you've got a rising empire and you've got your current empire and there's this sort of clashing and that the rise of China is sort of like a, another law of Newtonian physics, as I wrote in our notes. But um, I just don't see that panning out as people thought it would maybe two months ago. So I guess I'm curious as to your perspective. How do you see um, all of this panning out? Is there going to be an investigation? Well, there's a lot in there. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the, 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 the idea that war is inevitable, I think is probably this is the exception that proves the rule. Um, I don't think there'll be, you know, large degrees of physical confrontation as China continues its rise. Um, and I think its rise is no. inevitable. Um, I think that the, on the on the other side, I can completely invert that and say there already is a war um, and it's happening online. Mm. There is a lot of um, cyber sort of war going on. Um, essentially, it's, a, it's, it's weird to say that it's an un- unregulated war, but essentially... Uh, the internet is an un- unregulated um, sort of battleground. Mm. Um, so there's a, a lot going on there than, than I think we think. Um, I think, you know, even I'd be surprised, uh, I think you've actually understood the scale. I don't think anybody truly understands the scale of what's going on um, online. Mm. Um, I think that... America, the, the, the U.S.'s handling of this is, is just is one of the greatest own goals in, you know, geopolitics, uh, probably in history. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, created or, or, or completely diminished um, a lot of any confidence that the, that the sort of global community had in the U.S.'s ability to, to lead. Um, and and particularly not just to lead domestically, but but to actually lead in the world, like you know, really, you know, since post-war, um, that has been the U.S.'s role, and and the role that, that they sort of carved out for themselves as a global superpower was not just to lead domestically, but to lead domestically by example, and where necessary, to be the global leader and to actually go beyond their borders. Um, and I think the the, the complete incompetence that they've shown um, with with the coronavirus has, has massively diminished that. Um, I, I basically just don't trust most of what I hear these days. So when I sort of hear or, or when I see a lot of blame being piled on China and sort of this idea about we need an investigation, um, I think that that is, that probably has, there's a lot of motivations behind that. Um, you know, I think the motivation from, from, politicians you know domestic politicians so sort of you know penny wong is probably that she's just getting a lot of questions and she's you know people respond to what they're saying in the media the media is basically looking for any angle on this they can um they see that you know whipping up tribalism is is a fantastic way to um get eyeballs right now so you know in a, in a world where over the last three months everyone has become you know more tribal I noticed even before when you were sort of holding up that chart of, um, of yeah. that had Australia on it, you actually said us, you know, you said, you know, we're here and Japan's here and South Korea is here. It's, you know, tribalism is baked into this crisis. Um, and so I think there is, uh, the, the, there's a, a sort of a, a natural tone of tribalism that's been everywhere. And it's unsurprising to see that then bubble up and have politicians responding to it by saying, oh, we need, we need an investigation. Mm-hmm. Um, when I'm not sure what's, what an investigation would prove. Um, and look, to be honest, I think that um, that sort of posturing to a large degree probably is only going to strengthen China's um, position in the long term um, because, you know, it, this isn't weapons of mass destruction. You know, no one can go in and, you know, properly investigate and understand things. The fact that there is censorship going on in China is is the most you know unsurprising thing on the planet. So, why there needs to be sort of an investigation, I'm I'm a bit baffled on. Um, 
And I feel like China basically has the strength at the moment that they can stand there and have this sort of, you know, fire coming in from people saying, oh, we need investigation. Oh, you've covered things up. And they're just like, yeah, but, you know, look at the US. And that's just just a bin fire over there. So I don't think it will do a lot of damage to them. And look, I mean, you know, the, the, the history of China is that they are more patient than anybody else. Um, mm. They've been waiting 100 years. You know, if this takes them another, you know, if this march takes them another 20 years, um, pardon the use of the word march there, but uh, <laughs> if, if, this, if this phase takes them another 20 years, they don't care. Um, you know, they've, they've had their sort of century of embarrassment. If it goes another 20 years, you know, in a 5,000, you know, what they consider to be a 5,000 year history, um, they're fine with that. Yeah. I, I don't, look, I don't think it's as inevitable. I think there are massive issues that China has uh, both economically and politically that means that it it just will never get to where the US has been in the past like if you would ask, but if you would ask but, though, but the US if, can come down to the, yeah yeah <laughs> the US can but, come down to them but if you had told me if you would ask me back in 2011 maybe 2010 i would have said oh yeah for sure because i think what really changed in china was the way that the country was run like China in particularly Shenzhen, I remember my dad told me this because he would go to Shenzhen for work maybe once every couple of years. And he said um, it was the change in the mood and the excitement from locals that made him start to realize, you know, people were very excited, um, very passionate. You, it was almost an inevitability. You could just see it in Shenzhen, like this will be the next Silicon Valley if it, if it isn't already. Um, and this will be where we all come to as sort of the the center of the tech world and the developing economy, uh, you know, economics of the world. But then a few years later, he was like, okay, things are starting to change. The mood of the people is changing, um, particularly the younger generation, the way that people do business is changing. Um, it's become, he said to me, it's become a bit more gangster-like if that makes sense, there's a lot more under the table type stuff. It was, it had become less transparent. Um, so I think that that is a massive issue. And also the fact that they still rely on uh, this economy, which requires us dollars until they can get around that fact. Um, I just can't see them being the next, I can see them being the regional superpower, but I can't see them being equal to the U S uh, for, for how shit the U S has been. Um, yeah. Well, and, and, and that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, it, it, it's fascinating to be saying this now because you certainly wouldn't, you know, five or six years ago, which, which is that the most unpredictable part of the equation is actually what's happening, what's going on in the U S mm. um, that's the, that's the biggest unknown factor. Yeah. But I think, uh, I think another angle on that though, is that, and, and, you know, this is the thing if we sort of, if you want to think about this on the sort of time scale of, of like, you know, K waves of like 60 years, then I think a danger is, is, and it's been a bit of a theme of, of this whole chat is, is that it's hard to see what you're in the middle of. Mm. And, and it, it's, it's hard to sort of recognize the change because the change fundamentally is unfamiliar. And so I think if we're looking for, um, you know, the, whatever the next global superpower is to look like what the previous one was, that's the danger. So do you have to, you know, control the currency? I'm not sure. Is like, is the sort of level of censorship um, actually an issue or actually is it, is it perfectly fine? Um, you know, I sort of, if, if you can sort of fast forward a little bit and, and if you do a bit of mental gymnastics and say, right, let's consider like in 20 years, um, China is sort of a global superpower. What could that look like? I think maybe something interesting to consider is in 60 years, uh, sorry, in 20 years. So when I'm like, when I'm 60, the, the difference between sort of, um, like, let's call it sort of that, the post-war K wave um, where America really dominated, the difference between that um, and a, 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 a China sort of world, centered world is probably less different to sort of Victorian England, so the, the, the British Empire, the peak of the British Empire, and um, sort of Hitler and Stalin, 
and and sort of that. And and yet that sort of if you if you if you just break things into sixty year periods, that's basically what you have. You know, if we had China China's rise now, you take that into sort of one K wave, and then you go right post war America and them dominating some before that. You know, before that you have sort of the the rise of nationalism and fascism. And before that, you know, the 60 years before that is essentially Victorian England and, and sort of the peak of the British Empire. Mm. You know, the difference between the British Empire and sort of, you know, World War One Europe was was remarkable. The difference between sort of a, you know, US-centric post-war, you know, towards the end of that era, sort of neoliberal um, sort of organised world and where we could end up with China it's probably not that different, partially because China's just not interested in empire building. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know about the empire building thing. I feel like they've got some um, plans in the South China Sea, but but there well, are. Well, sorry, yeah, no, sorry. There is there is there is one massive caveat. There is they're not interested in empire building, apart from where they have always been interested in empire building. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, but you you the, the great thing about China is you can just look back over five thousand years, and you will know how they're going to act for the next five thousand, essentially, mm. where they're, they're they're not going to embark on empire building outside of the pieces that they've always felt a part of. You know. The, uh, the 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 center of the world um, that you know do we return to a tributary state sort of system like you know has the you know we we're talking about Vietnam before you know has the tributary system actually ever disappeared um, it definitely sort of declined well you know in the in the era of the Asian tigers but arguably you know the tributary system is on its way back and to a, you know you, what one way to look at the whole Belt and Road plan is that it is a massive revival of, of the of the Chinese tributary state system. So, you know, it, 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 it's it's not terribly hard to see what they're planning to do. And it's it's one of the things I find fascinating about China is it's, it's pretty much out in the open. They're pretty open about what they want. Uh, they're just more patient than everybody else. Mm. The, the, the point about superpowers is interesting. I, I feel like the, the commonality amongst all those is that they've always been the maritime superpower. That's at least the, the analysis at the ge- geopolitical level. So that is one thing that China will have to work on over the next 20 years is their Navy. They, they, if they want to be anywhere near being a superpower, they need to have at least 10 carriers, I would say, particularly in Asia. So here's an argument though, because actually if you, if you wind back, if you wind back enough, the whole seagoing, you know, dynasty starts to, um, starts to be question. You do have periods where, you know, being on the ocean was was the thing, but you also had periods where um, you, you had a ruling, you know, the, the, the global superpower um, was not necessarily seafaring. But one challenge that I'd have to that is that perhaps the new seafaring nation um, is actually the one with the, with, the, with the strongest navy on the internet. Mm, that's interesting. The strongest navy on the internet. I like that. So in that case, as far as as far as I would be concerned, China's won. Mm. Yeah, there's there's so much there because I don't even know how those sort of things are measured. Um, and I actually put a note down from our earlier points around um, the internet, trying to understand how those things are measured. Um, we're running out of time. I could ask you a million more things, like. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you you're going to be getting it, but the uh, the cash flow boost. I feel like so many businesses are getting this cash flow boost, and I'm intrigued as to what people are doing to invest invest it in. Uh, personal liberties. There's a bunch of stuff here, um, but we do have to jump into some rapid fire questions. So now that you've moved, I've got to ask, what does uh, the morning and evening routine look like? Uh, look, I've got I've got clients in um, the US, uh, UK, Dublin, so I'm always uh, on calls early. So um, in that sense, it hasn't changed. Um, I moved out of my office uh, when we moved here because I've got my own office here. Um, that wasn't actually because of coronavirus; it was just because I had an office here. So um, yeah, that that part hasn't changed much. I'm not actually going out physically and seeing my Melbourne clients, which uh, is disappointing and annoying and I miss them, but, you know, lots of screen time. Um, so, no, yeah, look, n- not a big change to the way that I work and how I work. If anything, it's become a little less structured. 
um, because previously if I was physically with somebody, then obviously I was 100% focused on them. Um, but now, you know, it's the task switching is probably maybe 20% higher than it used to be. And mm. to be honest, I'm looking forward to going back to a world where I can be more clear on how I'm looking at my time. Yeah, uh, I, I could see how that physical element would add to that. I, I think you mentioned it earlier, but uh, the biggest thing I'm missing is um, interpersonal or human contact. Um, I never thought I'd miss the office so much because I thought they're just a distraction factory. But uh, yeah, I'm, it's it's getting very fucking frustrating. Like I, I, I like the ability to be able to do deep work in the morning and then go in the afternoon and have conversations around things. Yeah. Um, at, at night, what are you sort of uh, watching in the evenings? Uh, sadly, I've been doing a lot of work with um, with with Dublin uh, in the evenings recently. And when I haven't been doing that, we've you know we've 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 basically been sort of uh, doing the house. So I've been running around fixing little things um, or cleaning up after tradespeople. Um, so sadly, not a lot of uh, relaxation. The only thing that with the sort of the one treat that we've had is we've we watched the second season of Afterlife um, on Netflix. Okay, which, very good series. Is, it's just wonderful. It's just so lovely. I love it. It's, yeah, it's everything I want. It's not too, you know, it's not a brain drain. It's it looks, you know, it's it's just a beautiful thing. I love Ricky Gervais sort of trying to be genuine. <laughs> I can't believe I've gotten my dad into Ricky Gervais. I think he saw um his special and then he was like, oh. He's got this show, Afterlife. <laughs> and then he goes and watches both seasons within like a week. Um, I'm nearly at the end of this season because I've been um, intermittently watching the Michael Jordan uh, doco, which I found very fascinating um, as a sports fan. Um, what do you think has been the best purchase of something? It's going to be under 200 bucks that, you, that you've been using throughout this time doesn't have to be made during this lockdown period, but um, what's sort of been the handiest item that you've come across? Uh, under 200, right? By far, my Stanley Fat Max ratcheting screwdriver. <laughs> uh, it's, it's ratcheting, so you can really easily, like, do, th- do things, that. undo things. It's got all the bits in the end, so you can very easily swap out bits, and you can do hex bolts. You can do, you can do anything you want. Um, it's a really solid tool. I, uh, you know, uh, one of my mantras that I stole from my dad was never buy cheap tools. And it's a, yeah. it's a beautiful tool. And I actually commented to, um, to our electrician the other day, um, who handily our electrician is my best mate. So it was a bit of a, a bit of a hack. Um, but, uh, yeah, I commented to him, I've, I've never loved this tool so much because I'm literally just running around the house and there's so many things where I'm just like, oh, I've got to whip that off and clean it up or fix it up or change it or move it. So yeah, Stanley Fat Max screwdriver. Uh, Stanley Fat check, sh- check the show links. Is that what we say? You can get <laughs> yeah. an Amazon affiliate thing. <laughs> Stanley Fat Max. Is that one of those things, um, like, did you get it from Bunnings? Have you made many Bunnings trips at all during this? So time? many Bunnings trips. Yeah. But the thing is, I stopped making Bunnings trips about two weeks ago when I got scared as to how many people were <laughs> arriving at Bunnings. But it has been amazing. Like, because I'm um, really into bonsai now. Like, I started probably in November, but I am deep, deep in it now. Like, I'm talking, uh, looking at videos and forums on the perfect soil mix. <laughs> to get nice. to get growth to get growth out of certain plants. So um, nice. yeah, l- little visits to Bunnings has been handy. Side note for anyone listening: never buy a bonsai from Bunnings. They're absolute dog shit. Um, go find. It's like a place there, in Hawthorne, so. isn't it? There's a place in Hawthorne. That's bonsai like the, farm. The, the, bon, yeah, he yeah. that guy is amazing. He actually had the first ever bonsai show in Australia on SBS, and I didn't notice. At all, but just an um, amazing bonsai, amazing bonsai there. Yeah, expensive bonsai there. Expensive, but also like for supplies, he's very affordable. Like most pots are around twenty, forty dollars. Like we're talking very, very good pots, and his soil mix is elite. And if you bring anything into him, he'll tell you what to do with it. So, um, can't remember his name, but I love him, and uh, he's unfortunately only open one day a week and currently closed due to lockdown. So I'm looking forward to going next Saturday. Um, look, Nick, as always, love doing this. Sad that we can't get up for coffee at the moment. Um, but um, hopefully once some of these lockdowns are relaxed a bit more, we can do that again. But um, thanks for coming on the show. All right. Thank you.
Who knows? Maybe Monday we'll be able to have a coffee. Hey, <laughs> it is Monday, isn't it? May eleventh. May eleventh. Okay, there you go. All right, thanks, mate. <laughs> Wonderful, thanks, mate. Thank you so much for watching Uncommon and this week's episode. If you like it, smash that like button. If you want to keep up to date with what we're doing, please do subscribe. We would love that. We'd love to build this audience that we're growing here of Uncommoners. Uh, If you want to keep up to date with audio, you can search for us on all of your good podcast apps. It's Uncommon or Uncommon Show will typically find us. For social, you want to see behind the scenes this amazing studio that I'm sitting in, just search at uncommon underscore show uh, and everything will be there, including our weekly promos. But um, look, thanks so much for stopping by. Until next time, thanks for watching.